Welcome to the True Crime Family Channel. Today we'll be delving into a horrifying case set in the quiet town of Saintsville in early 2010. Our story involves a priest with a secret, a fetish, and a murder that will chill you to your bones. On a damp March morning in 2010, Angela's lifeless body was discovered in her basement by her husband Tom, who had returned unexpectedly from a business trip. The sight was chilling. Her body was sprawled on the cold concrete floor with a leather whip tightly wound around her neck. The scene was one that brought with it fear and sadness through the town of Saintsville. The police were immediately called and within hours the investigation began, unraveling a twisted tale of secret desires, betrayal, and murder that no one could have imagined. Father Michael O'Reilly wasn't always a man torn between his duties to God and his darker desires. Years ago, before coming to Saintsville, he had briefly indulged in the BDSM world with a partner who understood his needs. They met in secret, far from the prying eyes of the devout community he served. The woman was a fellow churchgoer Someone who, like Michael, needed the thrill of submission and dominance. Their arrangement was intense, but brief. She eventually moved away to pursue a new life, leaving Father Michael alone to wrestle with the forbidden cravings she had awakened in him. After she left, Michael resolved to bury those desires. He threw himself into his priestly duties becoming a pillar of the community in Saintsville, a small town where such urges were not only taboo, but utterly unthinkable. For years, he succeeded in suppressing his fantasies, convincing himself that they were behind him. Yet they lingered, gnawing at the edges of his mind, waiting for the right moment to resurface. That moment came one ordinary afternoon during confession. Angela, a woman Michael knew only as the wife of Tom, a wealthy businessman, entered the confessional. She had always appeared to be the perfect suburban wife, charming, devoted, and supportive of her husband's endeavors. But what she revealed to Michael that day shattered the image he had of her. With a trembling voice, Angela confessed that she had cheated on her husband. Her sin was not just infidelity, but the nature of the affair. The man she had been with was domineering, a lover of BDSM. And in the throes of their passionate encounters, Angela discovered a side of herself she never knew existed. She found herself enthralled by the power dynamics, the sensation of being both in control and utterly powerless and she couldn't deny how much she enjoyed it. Angela wept as she spoke, torn between guilt and the deep longing for more. She knew it was wrong, but the craving for that kind of intimacy had awakened something inside her, something she couldn't simply ignore. As Angela poured out her soul, Father Michael sat in stunned silence, his heart pounding in his chest. Her confession was a mirror of his own buried desires, ones he had tried so hard to forget. The very thing he had fought to suppress for years was now being confessed to him by someone in his flock. He knew he should counsel her to resist these urges, to repent and return to the righteous path. But instead, his mind wandered, replaying her words, picturing the scenes she described. After she left, Michael found himself unable to focus on anything but Angela's confession. It was as if she had reignited a fire within him that he had long believed to be extinguished. He knew he had to see her again, to talk to her outside the confessional, to explore this connection that had so unexpectedly emerged. But he had to be careful. He couldn't simply approach her and suggest they discuss her newfound desires. 
he needed a pretext, something that would allow them to meet without arousing suspicion. Days passed, and Michael's obsession grew. He began to look for opportunities to speak to Angela, to find a reason to visit her. He rationalized his intentions, telling himself it was his duty to help her overcome her sinful desires. But deep down, he knew the truth. He wanted to be the one to fulfill them. Finally, Michael found his opening. He approached Angela after Mass one Sunday, offering to provide spiritual guidance and support as she dealt with her guilt. She hesitated at first but agreed, grateful for his concern. Their conversations began innocently enough, discussing her marriage, her feelings of inadequacy, and her struggle with temptation. But as time passed, the discussions became more intimate, more focused on her experiences with BDSM. And Michael's curiosity about her thoughts and feelings grew insatiable. One day, under the guise of pastoral counseling, Michael suggested they meet at her home where they could speak more privately. Angela, trusting him as her priest, agreed. They started meeting in her living room, but soon their conversations moved to the basement, Angela's secret world. The dim, secluded space felt safe, cut off from the outside world, and it wasn't long before their talks turned into something much more. The boundaries blurred, and their relationship transformed from spiritual guidance to a full-blown affair. In that basement, Father Michael and Angela indulged in the desires they had both kept hidden for so long. What began as a forbidden connection through confession quickly spiraled into a dangerous obsession with each encounter driving them deeper into the web of secrecy and sin that would eventually lead to their downfall. As Father Michael became more entangled in his secret life with Angela, his once impeccable reputation began to show cracks. The priest, who had once been the embodiment of devotion, now started to exhibit behavior that raised eyebrows in the small, tightly knit town of Saintsville. Parishioners noticed his increasing absences. Where he once spent his days in quiet reflection and service to the community, he now frequently disappeared for hours on end, often missing appointments or being late for church services. Initially, the townspeople gave him the benefit of the doubt, chalking it up to the pressures of his demanding role. But soon, the whispers began. The town's gossips, the older women who lingered after Mass, the shopkeepers who watched everyone come and go, and the neighbors who prided themselves on knowing everyone's business, started to notice patterns. They noticed how Father Michael's car would be parked in the same spot on Angela's street at odd hours, how he seemed more anxious and distracted. It wasn't long before these observations turned into rumors, and rumors turned into scandalous tales of a secret affair. At first, no one dared confront the priest. His position in the community commanded respect, and his stern demeanor discouraged questions. But as the story spread, even the most devout members of the congregation began to look at him with suspicion. Angela, too, began to feel the weight of these rumors. She had always been careful, making sure her sessions with Father Michael were discreet. But now, she couldn't ignore the subtle changes in the way people treated her. The sideways glances, the sudden silences when she entered a room, the cold smiles that didn't reach the eyes. These were all signs that the town was talking. The thought of being exposed terrified her. Angela's husband, Tom, was a man of strict morals. He was deeply involved in the community and held his wife to the highest standards. If he found out about her secret life, 
it would ruin their marriage and shatter the image she had carefully crafted over the years. The very thought of Tom discovering her infidelity, let alone the BDSM sessions with the town's priest, sent Angela into a spiral of panic and paranoia. As the pressure mounted, Angela's fear began to consume her. She started to believe that every whisper was about her. Every glance was a sign that someone knew her secret. Her once confident demeanor crumbled, replaced by a constant state of anxiety. The paranoia seeped into every aspect of her life. She began to jump at small noises, avoided social gatherings, and even started questioning her own friend's loyalty. One evening, overwhelmed by the burden of her double life, Angela sought solace in her best friend, Clara. Clara had been her confidant for years, someone she could trust with her deepest secrets. So, in a moment of desperation, Angela confessed everything. Her sessions with Father Michael, the guilt that gnawed at her, and the fear that her husband would find out. She hoped Clara would understand, perhaps offer some advice on how to extricate herself from the situation without causing a scandal. Clara, however, was unprepared for the gravity of what Angela revealed. She listened in shocked silence as Angela poured out her soul, her face betraying a mix of fear and disapproval. Though Clara promised to keep the secret, Angela could see the uncertainty in her eyes. She knew it was only a matter of time before the rumors reached Tom. Her once perfect life was unraveling before her eyes and the walls were closing in. The pressure became unbearable. Angela decided she had had enough. The thrill that had once come with her secret sessions was now replaced by a deep sense of dread. Every moment spent with Father Michael felt like a countdown to disaster. She couldn't keep up the charade any longer, and she knew she had to end it before it destroyed her completely. Determined to put an end to the affair, Angela called Father Michael and asked him to meet her at her house that evening. This time, she wasn't inviting him to the basement for one of their usual sessions. Instead, she planned to confront him, to tell him that it was over, that they could no longer continue their sinful relationship. Angela hoped that ending things would somehow stop the rumors and give her a chance to salvage what was left of her marriage. As she waited for Father Michael to arrive, Angela's mind raced with fear and doubt. She knew this conversation would not be easy. Michael had become increasingly possessive and dependent on their meetings. Ending it might push him to do something drastic. But Angela was resolute. She needed to reclaim control of her life, to stop living in fear of being exposed. Father Michael arrived at Angela's house, his mind racing with conflicting emotions, fear, desire, guilt, and a desperate need to preserve his secret. As he walked to the door, he sensed something different in the air, a tension that hadn't been there before. Angela greeted him at the door, her face pale, her demeanor cold. The usual excitement and anticipation that marked their previous encounters were replaced by an icy resolve. They descended into the basement, the very place that had been their haven of secrecy. But tonight, it felt more like a chamber of doom. Angela wasted no time. She confronted Michael, her voice trembling but determined. She told him that their affair had to end, that the rumors spreading through town were getting out of control, and that she was terrified of her husband finding out. She demanded that Michael leave town immediately, suggesting that if he didn't, she would go to the authorities herself. She had no intention of ruining her life any further, and was willing to do whatever it took to protect her marriage and reputation. 
But Michael wasn't ready to give up. Panic surged through him as he realized that Angela was serious. He tried to reason with her, his words growing more frantic as he pleaded for her not to end things so abruptly. But Angela was resolute. She wanted out. Michael, feeling cornered and helpless, could see his entire life crumbling before him. The fear of losing everything, his position, his reputation, and his very freedom overwhelmed him. As Angela turned away, preparing to leave the basement and put an end to their twisted affair, something inside Michael snapped. In a blind, uncontrollable rage, he reached for the leather whip they had used in their sessions, a symbol of their secret world, now turned into a weapon. With terrifying force, he wrapped it around Angela's neck. She struggled, her hands clawing at the whip, but Michael's grip was too strong, his desperation too powerful. The room echoed with the sounds of her muffled cries and the struggle for breath, but it was over within minutes. Angela's body went limp, and she collapsed to the floor, lifeless. As reality set in, Father Michael stood over Angela's body, his breath ragged, his mind reeling from what he had just done. He was no longer just a man of the cloth. He was now a murderer. Panic flooded his senses, and the urge to escape the situation at all costs took hold. He knew he had to cover up his crime, to make it look like an accident, something that could be explained away. He hastily began to stage the scene, trying to erase any evidence that might link him to Angela's death. He removed any items that bore his fingerprints, wiped down surfaces, and arranged Angela's body in a way that suggested she had died during one of their BDSM sessions. Michael placed the whip in a position that implied it had been an accidental strangulation, hoping that the authorities would accept this as a tragic mishap. But in his frantic state, Michael made mistakes. He overlooked small but significant details, the way Angela's clothes were disheveled, the marks on her neck that indicated a struggle, and fibers from his clothing that had transferred onto her. His attempts to clean up were rushed, and in his panic, he failed to notice that he had left behind incriminating evidence. With the scene set to look like an unfortunate accident, Michael fled the house, his heart pounding as he drove away. He prayed that his status as a respected priest would shield him from suspicion, that no one would connect him to the crime. But deep down, he knew that the truth had a way of surfacing, no matter how well one tried to hide it. The next morning, Tom returned from his business trip, completely unaware of the tragedy that awaited him. When he entered the house, he was greeted by an unsettling silence. Calling out for Angela and receiving no response, he searched the house until he descended into the basement, where he made the horrifying discovery. Angela's lifeless body, lying still on the cold floor. Tom's scream of anguish echoed through the house as he dialed 911, bringing the police to the scene within minutes. Initially, the officers were prepared to classify the death as an unfortunate accident during a BDSM session, something that, while unusual, was not unheard of. The scene, at first glance, seemed to support this theory. Angela's position, the leather whip, and the general setup all pointed to a tragic mistake. However, as the forensic team began their investigation, inconsistencies emerged that suggested something far more sinister. On March 8th, the forensic team found that the marks on Angela's neck were not consistent with an accidental strangulation. Instead, they indicated a struggle, suggesting that someone had forcefully held the whip around her neck. This finding immediately raised red flags. 
Further examination revealed fibers on Angela's clothing that didn't belong to her or her husband. These fibers were traced back to the specific clothing material used in priestly garments. Additionally, the hasty cleanup job left behind smudges and partial fingerprints that couldn't be explained by an accidental death scenario. The turning point in the investigation came when an anonymous tip was received by the police, suggesting that Father Michael had been visiting Angela's house in secret. This tip opened a new avenue of inquiry, leading the investigators to re-examine the timeline of events. They uncovered that Michael's car had been spotted near Angela's house on the night of her death, and several witnesses confirmed seeing him leave the premises late that evening. With this new evidence in hand, the police shifted their focus to Michael. Over the next few days, they built a case against him, piecing together the sequence of events that led to Angela's death. On March 12, 2010, Father Michael was brought in for questioning. The once revered priest, now under intense scrutiny, struggled to maintain his composure as the detectives presented him with the evidence they had gathered. He denied everything at first, but the weight of the proof against him was undeniable. As the investigation continued, more damning evidence came to light. Phone records showing Michael's frequent calls to Angela, text messages that hinted at their relationship, and testimony from parishioners who had noticed his suspicious behavior. By March 20, 2010, the police had gathered enough evidence to formally charge Father Michael with Angela's murder. The town was left in shock as the man they had once seen as a symbol of virtue was led away in handcuffs, facing the full consequences of his actions. The trial of Father Michael O'Reilly, which began on October 2, 2010, captivated not only the small town of Saintsville, but the entire nation. The media swarmed the courthouse eager to report on the shocking details of the case. Headlines blared with sensationalized accounts of the priest's secret life, drawing in viewers and readers who were eager to follow the scandalous story. The courtroom was packed with spectators, townsfolk, who had once looked up to Father Michael, now filled with a mix of curiosity, disbelief, and betrayal. The prosecution wasted no time in laying out their case, painting a vivid picture of the events that had led to Angela's death. Prosecutor James Vickers, a sharp and relentless attorney, methodically presented the evidence that had been painstakingly gathered during the investigation. The prosecution's opening statement was damning. Vickers detailed how Father Michael, a man sworn to celibacy and moral integrity had secretly engaged in a sordid affair with Angela, a married woman. He outlined how Michael's obsession with BDSM had driven him to seek out Angela after his previous partner left town, eventually leading to the tragic events of March 8th. Vickers emphasized that Angela's death was no accident, but a cold-blooded murder committed out of fear and desperation. Key testimonies followed, each one adding weight to the prosecution's case. Clara, Angela's best friend, took the stand and recounted the conversation she had with Angela just days before her death. Clara's voice trembled as she described Angela's fear and her decision to end the affair with Michael. Her testimony was powerful as it not only provided a motive for the murder, but also painted Michael as a man capable of extreme actions when cornered. The forensic experts were next, presenting the scientific evidence that linked Michael to the crime. They explained in detail the marks on Angela's neck, the fibers found on her clothing, and the inconsistencies in the scene that pointed to a staged cover-up. 
the prosecution left no stone unturned, ensuring that the jury understood how each piece of evidence contributed to the conclusion that Michael had intentionally killed Angela. Throughout the trial, Michael's defense team struggled to counter the overwhelming evidence. They attempted to argue that Angela's death was a tragic accident, a result of consensual BDSM play gone wrong. However, this defense was weak in the face of the prosecution's airtight case. The defense's efforts to portray Michael as a victim of circumstance only served to further alienate him from the jury and the community. Michael himself remained stoic throughout the proceedings, his face a mask of emotionless detachment. This demeanor, rather than garnering sympathy, only deepened the perception that he was a man without remorse, a man who had coldly taken a life to protect his secrets. On December 5, 2010, after weeks of testimony and deliberation, the jury returned with their verdict. The courtroom was silent, the air thick with tension, as the jury foreman stood to deliver the decision. Guilty, he announced, his voice clear and unwavering. The words reverberated through the room, and everyone who was present could testify that this was the end. Father Michael O'Reilly, once a pillar of the community, now stood convicted of first-degree murder. The judge, taking into account the premeditated nature of the crime and the breach of trust Michael had committed as a priest, sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The sentence was met with a mix of relief and sorrow, relief that justice had been served but sorrow for the man who had fallen so far from grace. The impact of the trial and its outcome was profound, leaving a lasting scar on Saintsville. The once thriving church, where Father Michael had served for over a decade, quickly fell into disarray. Parishioners, disillusioned and heartbroken, stopped attending services. The church, a cornerstone of the community, became a symbol of the betrayal they felt. Within months, it closed its doors for good, abandoned and forgotten, much like the man who had once led it. The community itself was never the same. The scandal had shattered the trust that had once bound the residents together. Neighbors eyed each other with suspicion. Gossip ran rampant, and the once close-knit town became a shadow of its former self. The whispers of what had happened in Angela's basement and the courtroom echoed in every corner of Saintsville, a constant reminder of the darkness that had been uncovered. Tom, Angela's widowed husband, found himself unable to stay in the town that had become a graveyard of memories. Overwhelmed by grief and haunted by the events that had led to his wife's death, he sold their house the house where the horrific events had unfolded and left Saintsville for good. He sought solace in anonymity, moving to a distant city where he could try to rebuild his life, free from the shadows of his past. Father Michael, now inmate, 46291, was transferred to a maximum security prison where he would spend the rest of his days. Stripped of his title, his freedom, and his reputation, he became just another prisoner, lost among the sea of faces in the penal system. As the walls of the maximum security prison closed in on Father Michael, one can't help but reflect on the path that led him here. Was it the relentless pressure of his hidden desires that turned a man of God into a murderer? Or did the facade he wore every day, concealing his true nature, finally crack under the weight of his own hypocrisy. Some say that the seeds of his downfall were sown long before he ever met Angela, that his darkness was always there, lurking beneath the surface, waiting for the right moment to take over. And yet, we are left to wonder, could Father Michael have chosen a different path? 
Could he have sought help, confessed his sins in the same confessional where Angela once bared her soul? Would things have turned out differently if he had? Or was his fate sealed the moment he decided to act on his forbidden fantasies, to let them rule his life instead of keeping them buried? Now Father Michael is just another name, another number in the system, stripped of everything that once defined him. His story is a chilling reminder of how easily one's life can spiral out of control when secrets become too heavy to bear. The man who once stood as a pillar of the community is now a cautionary tale, a symbol of how unchecked desires can destroy everything in their path. So as you think about this twisted tale of betrayal, murder, and hidden darkness, ask yourself, what would you have done in Father Michael's place? Could you have resisted the pull of your darkest urges, or would you have fallen just as he did? And remember, there are countless stories like this one. Tales of people who allowed their obsessions to become their undoing. Make sure to stay with us as we explore more of these gripping true crime stories, each more shocking than the last. Subscribe now so you never miss a moment of the drama, the intrigue, and the chilling consequences of lives lived on the edge.